Slack there, if you would lead us, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Roll call, please, Deb. Councilman Hewitt, Councilman Dewitt, Councilman Slacka. Aye. Here. Mayor Simmons. Here. Deputy Mayor O'Flynn. Here. Councilman Gibson. Here. Councilman Forbes. Here. Amy just walked in. Deputy. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, public comment from anyone? No, <laughs> you're part of the meeting. <laughs> okay, seeing none, um, why don't we start? Um, this is great we're doing this. It's, uh, I feel like we've all talked, but we really haven't talked in one big meeting. Uh, it's what we intended to do a while ago, obviously. Irma uh, got in the way most recently. Um, the other day when we met on council, uh, we talked about this would be you know, a collegial workshop uh, meant to focus on stewardship of the Wonder Gardens, um, and really, uh, in large part, hearing from the Wonder Gardens board, who has done all this wonderful work over time, about uh, what the vision of the Wonder Gardens is, together, obviously, with Thomas. Um, so I intended uh, to be open and free-flowing workshop of ideas, uh, based uh, as a start on what you guys have done, which you you've all put the hard work in. So we thank you for that. Um, Anyone on council like to add anything? Okay, with that, Trish. Well, good morning, uh, council and mayor. Can you hear us, mayor? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot one housekeeping thing. Yes. Um, uh, we need to take a vote uh, with respect to Peter being up in the sky. So, uh, <laughs> no, that's all right. Now, my second motion <laughs> is that, <laughs> um, considering uh, extraordinary circumstances, I'd like to ask council's approval and vote. Uh, to waive Peter and, and allow him to uh, allow the mayor to participate in the meeting. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, Since it's a workshop, do we need to vote? Um, it's well, it's, we're voting on uh, inclusion, uh, but let's vote anyhow. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, roll call. Councilman Blackstock. Aye. Mayor Simmons. Aye. Deputy Mayor O'Flynn. Aye. Councilman Gibson. Aye. Councilman Forbes. Aye. Councilwoman Rumba. Aye. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Trish. That's okay. Well, good morning. I thought before we get started, uh, we have some new faces on our Everglades Wonder Gardens Board of Directors. Um, and first of all, thank you, um, Deputy Mayor, for uh, putting this together along with the city and all of the council. So for the record, um, each of you will cite your name and um, uh, even what position if you have on the, the board. So I will start. I'm Trish Leonard, and I'm the president of the Everglades Wonder Gardens Board. I'm Donna Fomang. I'm secretary of the board. Vince Motorelli, board member. Linda Gutschall, board member. John Mathis, board member. Marjorie Rubacki, board member. Peg Van Orney, new board member. Jackie McCurdy, board member. Leslie Weidenmiller, treasurer. Mike Gibson, board member. Jane Lyles, board member. Fred Forbes, council member. <coughs> Russ Anderson, board member. Amy Caramba, council. Yeah, Peter O'Flynn. Stephen Saika, council. Sabra Smith, board member. <coughs> Thomas Hecker, ex executive director. Debbie Brandle, board member. Mary Mima, board member. Okay, thank you. We also have another new board member who was unable to be here today, Amy uh, Valvias. I probably pronounced her name incorrectly, but uh, if she does pop in, we have her name tag. So currently, uh, we have um, 18 board of directors, three who are brand new to the board as of September. Um, so we're excited that we are moving forward with our board. Um, 
before we uh, where we were planning on having our retreat September 15th um, due to Irma obviously we had to change the retreat date but we did host the retreat on Wednesday October 25th um, I have handed Carl and um, Mayor Deputy Mayor O'Flynn a copy of our notes from the retreat and we'll get a copy for everybody else I'll probably email them out but basically we had an outside facilitator who helped us, um, guided us through a four-hour workshop retreat to kind of see where we're headed. I mean, obviously, it's different. Our, our The Wonder Gardens um, is a new Wonder Gardens, and I know many of you have been over there to look at the, the gardens over the last um, few weeks uh, during the Irma. I do want to thank, you know, Thomas and his staff because they have put in countless hours cleaning up the gardens to get it prepared for our uh, opening so that we could be open for the entire season uh, to our visitors and customers. And he did put together a presentation which I think you'll be uh, impressed and then there will be a Q&A of all the things that are happening um, at the gardens currently. We, are, we plan to move forward. We do not want to kind of look backwards. I think that's for the best for all of us. For stewardship is where, we're, where mm -hmm. we're headed. And I think that's the direction that you all as council have given us and that's kind of what we were, went for. I have presented each of you with a media book. This book is for each council person and for the city, and there'll be one for the Wonder Gardens of all media that has the name Bonita Springs or the Everglades Wonder Gardens since May of this year, up until last week when we held the Brew for the Birds and the Family Fun Day. So I just want you to have that, keep it, read it when you're, you know, kind of not doing much, you know? <laughs> I hate to say it that way, no. But it's really some really good information and we couldn't have done it without the media. They've been awesome and so uh, this is something that's impressive. Um, at our board retreat, we had every board member but a couple, I believe, because they were out of town. We also had a guest, Dr. Beth Hagen, who was our education volunteer, who is also here with us this, after, uh, this morning. We held it at Northern Trust. Um, we talked a lot about the overview of where we are and what Irma created, and Thomas will get into the numbers and uh, Wes as far as uh, the financials, uh, the recovery and how, how we planned to open on the 4th of November. And we have the vision of what we think, but we also want your input so that it's the people's park. This belongs to the people. And so between all of us, we should be able to come together and work together is our main goal. Uh, we have some focus areas to work on, both in the uh, financial as well as in our operating. Um, we have some information about our out-of-town guests and visits. I want to say uh, on the day of the um, the Family Fun Day, this one couple and their four kids drove from Key Largo to come to the Family Open Day. That they, they went to church, they were saying, and then they drove this far just so that they could come. And they've been following the Wonder Gardens for months. I thought that was kind of interesting. We put in the media in there, like I said. Um, we have our current uh, board members and we are still soliciting for new board members so that we have rotation on our board. Um, we have our uh, action and accountabilities sheet that is here. And let me see what else I put in here. Um, the property and beyond. So I think with uh, this, we should, this piece here should help you as well. Trish, would you mind going through this action and accountability? Absolutely. Seems interesting. Can get my, let's see where I'm at. I don't mean line by line, but with the no. concept is different people are yes. taking on board different things? Yes. So we felt that we had to have some action and accountabilities um, in specific areas. And we have assigned um, different board members as well as dates of when these actions need to be completed. <laughs> and uh, well, I have, well, as an example, Brew for the Birds, the fundraiser, right. um, it should have been who's leading that. That would have been Sabra. <laughs> um, but it did happen, and um, we did, uh, I think we raised a little over $6,000 uh, for that date. The Family Fun Day, the following morning, we had a little over 1,000 people that came through the gates throughout the entire day, uh, free of charge, who were so happy. I just saw a lot of happiness when you were walking through the gardens, and, the, and that um, event was completely donated by donors 
and the community um, in itself, community businesses, including all the items that we um, gave away. Um, the summary results from the Bruce for the Birds and Fun Day, since it just happened last week, we're still working on all the numbers to get them totally gathered. Um, and a lot of this stuff's supposed to be done here by our November 7th board meeting, which we did bring this up at our meeting and kind of reiterated re of where we need to be. Um, so I see like budgets are in there, yeah. calendar events, yes. et cetera. Um, we need to meet with our new accountant. That's going to be Beth. She's going to help us put, um, so no. we can have, no, I meant nothing. Uh, we, we're in the process I'm sorry. of, um, of um, what's the right word? We're uh, evaluating. Evaluating. Options, so, <laughs> yeah. So, so sorry, evaluating. We don't currently, uh, we have right. uh, an audit team, but we need a separate CPA right. to yeah, do our yeah, month month. So Beth, That's right. My Beth apologies. Beth is helping me with that process. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll have a detailed calendar of events so that you can go on to uh, the website and check what's going on. We're developing budgets. I know Wes and Thomas have been, and Beth are all getting together on that. Um, let's see, final presentation. Transfer the GoFundMe. We did do a GoFundMe. Yeah, the GoFundMe, all the dollars right. that we raised from there. So okay. um, a, uh, for other council, if you want this, we will make sure you get it over so that you'll have that, okay? We just literally got this couple weeks, couple yeah. days ago, so. Um, but that's kind of what we're doing, trying to follow our, our Bible for right. first, better right. words in right here. Good, thank okay. you. So, anybody else want to jump in? One uh, housekeeping thing, uh, when board members speak, if you could actually, we all know who you are, but to give your name, it helps Debbie uh, when she's taking notes. And please speak into the microphone if you yeah. want. Yeah, if you have a mic, speak into it. Who's up? Well, I guess we'll have to You want to do the... Yeah, sure. presentation? Yeah. Okay. Whatever you want. Okay, so. With the lights off or on? We'll put them down a little. Okay. Tell me. Excuse me. Well, I'm getting mic'd here. Let me give you some. I passed around those Hurricane Irma updates. And there's uh, more to update ab about it. The in-kind services went from 11,000 to over 30,000 because putting the trees up, can everyone hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> cost a another 20,000 to upright the trees with O'Donnell Landscaping. I mean, it didn't cost us. He donated his uh, services. And then uh, donations here, cash donations was at 27,000. It's, uh, it's over 30,000 you know, as a result from Hurricane Irma. And then what I want to do here is um, go quickly through a PowerPoint. There's 60 slides, so I won't hover too long on them unless you have questions. And then when I get to the future, I'll flip over the, the storyboard over there, the kind of the master plan draft. And I have a, a laser so I can point back and forth. But anyway, our mission, our vision, you have um, a draft of kind of the the visions after I had started that's still a working draft. Uh, Councilman O'Flynn was interested in that. I don't know if hopefully he got a copy of that. And uh, as you know, I started January last year and we've um, brought in new team members and I'll touch on each one. Here are some of the highlights. And um, one of the things, you know, that takes a lot of time is the 990 and the audits and things like that. They take months and months and so we're almost, uh, at completion on those that's coming right around the corner. But the, the big push since the last time I did a presentation, we were kind of more like at 80 volunteers. So now we're over 200 volunteers just for Hurricane Irma that were 200 different volunteers that we hadn't had before. So it's really picked up. And then over 1,500 hours in the last two months as well as far as volunteer hours. And each one of those hours is worth $23 per hour. So. And you know each person brings a different talent as far as you know different volunteers. And th these are kind of the numbers. You know, the big other jump in this is um, the number of plants. You know, this from American Farms alone, we had over 4,000 plants donated, which is a value of close to $14,000. And they even delivered them because when the owner, who I've worked with closely for years, when I was at the botanical garden. A lot of times you had to go pick up the plants, so they delivered them. Because the biggest thing I have is a 
Odyssey minivan, so to get 4,000 plants in there is possible. I've probably done it over the course of a couple of years. And then uh, one of the other key things is we've been down two staff, two full-time staff since before the hurricane or during the hurricane, et cetera. So somehow we were able to pull it all off with uh, a smaller staff than we used to have. The another big jump during the hurricane was uh, Facebook followers. We were getting, before we were like at 25 per week, as far as new, we were getting over 100 per week. I was trying to do like three or four Facebook posts a day. So we kept that going. And then the other interesting number from the, as a result of the hurricane is um, over 180 donors. And we were at 80 donors before the hurricane and then had a, a, like another 100 during the last two months, like different donors. That's a, one of the only advantages of GoFundMe is that you can reach a larger audience if it's done correctly. If, it's, if different people share it and it keeps going viral, then you get anywhere from $5 donations up to, I think the bigger ones on GoFundMe are like 500. And where the other checks, people that donate money know not to use those services, so they just send a direct check which is good because there's less of a percentage taken out of it. And so the GoFundMe page was over $10,000 the other day, and, but the other like $20,000 came in through other means, through the website or through the, the mail. And then you know about me. And then other members, uh, the, the curator collection, she's been there since April, and there's been days where she's had to work, you know, day after day, and for the hurricane prep and after the hurricane, you know, she rarely got a day off, but everything was safe and sound, you know, during the hurricane and after. And uh, so Leslie's been very crucial to, you know, keep the, the wildlife collection moving forward and healthy and happy. And then we recently got a new education volunteer coordinator, uh, Zuliana Salerno, Salerno, who's bilingual, so that's a huge advantage. Kate, who was there, accepted a teaching position, which has the full benefits. So I, some of these people, you're lucky to have them while you have them before they move on to get full benefit packages if they need them. And so uh, I think Suliano will be there for a while, we hope. And then um, we have a new wildlife consultant, Jeremy Hargett. And uh, the, the advantage with him is he has his own wildlife center so we can get animals on loan like last week or so we got a 15-foot Burmese python and so he has all the things to keep our collection dynamic and he's working on getting his crocodiles and uh, but he knows a lot of little tricks of the trade where you know there's a lot of different diets that you know there's a lot less labor intensive but more nutritious and easier for us to handle like the crocodilian diet diet for example is a formulated by Perina Mills but then it has everything they need versus like getting a, a dead cow and cutting it up and you know yeah, throwing yeah. it to them that way. We still keep that for the, the third Thursday. We do gator feedings and we'll still do the meat like that with chicken or cattle. And then we have a new uh, artist in residence, uh, Mark Harris. He's a wildlife photographer and he has an exhibit right now where it's uh, birds of the Everglades to kind of go with our theme of the Everglades. And he'll be in there throughout the season. We'll have a meet and greet with him on the first Friday of uh, December. So that'll be going uh, out soon to gather up people to come visit and meet with him. And then, you know, these are all the different ways that we've uh, been doing fundraising. And I touched on those. And one of the pleasant surprises we had at the Family Fun Day, not only did we get like close to $2,000 in cash donations, even though we were free that day, people were putting in the cash box. But uh, the Rotary Club of Bonita Beach, the Sunset, they did a special, um, what was it called? Rock Rocktober Fest? <laughs> and they raised $6,000 total, and uh, the Bonita Assistance Office got 3,000, we got 3,000. And that was a, a really pleasant surprise. They unveiled it on the Family Fun Day. And uh, we, you never know who's going to come to our galas. And uh, hopefully we'll see everyone. That's one of our key things, too, is that this will be our third year of the Enchanted. And um, the, the committee's been working hard because, you know, there is some adaptive measures we have to do because the trees aren't quite the same <laughs> iconic trees that they used to be as far as lighting up. But there's still plenty of trees left over. So um, it's going to be, you know, 
even more beautiful than it ever has been. And um, we kind of haven't gone completely live, but on our website, it's the first thing you see. There's a beautiful video there. If you look at the video, it's just as classy as the, the wine festival in Naples. I don't know if, has everyone seen the video? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's really well done. Thanks, Trish, for getting Dale in to do that video pro bono. And that's one of the things that's kind of nice is that we get so many things donated or in kind. And you can see this, you know, last year we raised uh, 65,000 with 250 tickets sold. So this year we know we're going to be able to at least sell 250 tickets and hopefully raise over 100,000 this year. And that's, you know, the net proceeds. And then, as you know, Roof the Birds we touched on was a for the inaugural event, you know, it was incredible success. And it, it, and it still lives on. Um, Momentum has a, a beer, an IPA that's called Wonder Garden. So every time you go down there and drink, you'll be helping yeah. the Everglades Wonder Garden. So we get a portion of the proceeds. And it's actually a pretty good beer. <laughs> and uh, I'm not a beer person, but I was listening to all the other people come there like every night, every night and they were going on about it. So maybe it'll be part of their repertoire. And again, Family Fun Day was a resounding success. I mean, it, it felt so good to finally open back up. Because, you know, we, we had the fence open where you could kind of see the damage. And then once um, we sealed it off, then we left the element of surprise. Because, you know, planting 4,000 flowers goes a long way to help, you know, offset some of the damage that was done by the hurricane. And then we're, we're looking at some other ideas for fundraising. Um, you know, um, a different type of event, Harvest for the Gardens, hopefully we can pull that off soon, and Bonita and Bloom, I'm talking to Bonita Bay Garden Club about that one, and an Orchid Festival mm -hmm. also with Bonita Bay Garden Club. And the Chocolate Orchid Festival, they're huge successes where they've been done, but I was kind of keeping a secret until I knew whether I had Norman Love or not. It was called the Love Fest until he told me the other day that he's just way too busy this year, but next year, so now it's just a Chocolate and Orchid Festival. <laughs> Because it'd only be a love fest if Norman Love was there. Yeah. And then uh, again, reiterate, Enchanted. If you haven't bought your tickets yet, please hurry up and buy because it will sell out. And then Bruce for the birds. You know, thank you. How many people did you have there? We don't really have an official count. We know we had lots of glasses that were sold, and uh, so it's in the hundreds. And uh, we. We know next year how to do it better as far as, we were thinking it would be close to 200, but you know. It was more than that. Yeah, so we don't know the exact number because we were limited by glasses, but some people bought non-drinking tickets, which was unusual because it was a drinking event, but they still got in because the music was great and uh, you know, this the atmosphere, everything was great about it <laughs> that even if you didn't, weren't a beer drinker, and that was the other thing that the, the wine folks are whining, so we know <laughs> to have a little bit more wine. Or we didn't have any wine, so we'll have to figure out how to, you know, add wine to the event. But Sabre and her committee really brought in a whole new audience, and that was interesting about the Family Fun Day and this. It was, you know, people that had never been there before. That was what you know they just said they never. So they never knew what they were missing as far as the the trees that came down. But at the same time, with the trees coming down, it did open it up where we can have flowers. Here's the harvest for the gardens. I'm still trying to piece this together. And uh, Benita in Bloom, this is something that um, I know will be successful once we get going. It's like a plant foodie market type of thing. And it'd be a good partner with the, the different garden clubs in the area. And. Um, a lot of times, you know, we, you want to do things that are related to your mission. There's things like a hats in the garden at the botanical garden. It's, it's high income but low mission, and you have to find that balance of doing high mission and high income, which is hard to get that balance. Usually it's high mission like a plant sale, but then low return as far as people spending money. But as more and more people shop at Home Depots and box stores, the plan of uh, you know, availability isn't there, so this will give them an option of, um, you know, getting rare plants or different orchids and just having lectures about, you know, plants and, and food. Foods become very important to people where their food comes. So somehow we'll 
blend all that together for a market type of um, atmosphere in the spring. And you have to remember, spring for us, if you start to get into March and April, then it starts to get warm again. So spring in Florida is usually February as far as planting and it being just downright beautiful and it's after the threat of frost. Again, this chocolate festival, I know it'll be a, a success because uh, Fairchild started it down in Miami and they typically get 10,000 people per day on Saturday and Sunday. So people love chocolate and orchids, you can't go wrong. And then uh, membership has really taken off where... Excuse me, but don't forget the terraces. <coughs> the terraces is doing a fundraiser in early December, I think it's December 6th, uh, where they're, de they're bringing in heaven sent flowers and they're gonna decorate the whole place and they're gonna decorate one of the lovely uh, apartments and whatever is, whatever they get that day will be donated to the Wonder Gardens. And they're also a, uh, they're gonna be a sponsor for sure. the and what Marjorie was uh, saying is the terraces is doing a special fundraiser for us. And do you know the date in December? I'm pretty sure Six. it's the 6th. On December 6th. Six. And um, along with uh, Bonita Bay Garden Club, they were going to, I think they postponed their home tour this year and that we would have received the proceeds. So they're working hard to see what they can do, you know, differently to raise money for us. But if you're not a member, please join because um, there's so many benefits right now. You get 20% off in our gift shop. We raise that from 10% and then you get 10% off at participating businesses as well in the area. That um, uh, Survey Cafe, I know I use it over there a couple times a week. And then um, you can get into 200 different nature parks throughout the nation, usually free of charge. Just show them your membership card. And it might even include corkscrew and the conservancy. Sometimes there's a a block out, you know, and they'll add it later at the time they were part of it. But then if we start sending too many of our members to the conservancy, then they can put the block out of 90 mile radius. And the same with the American Horticultural Society. Starting in January 1st, you'll be able to get into 300 different botanical gardens. And I use this one a lot because if you go to Selby Gardens for a show, you know, their admission's over 20 some dollars. And so I can get in for half the admission, like $10 in Fairchild is their admissions closer to $20. So this adds up quickly. And, um, you know, if you go to Chicago for a trip or whatever, you can just go to the, you know, Chicago Botanical Garden for free or reduced. So it's definitely worth it just for that. And then, you know, as we increase the benefits of membership, then we know we will increase the members. And uh, currently we have over 400 and, um, you know, we, we had a goal of 500 before September for Bruce and the Birds, which was postponed. So because of the, the hurricane, you know, we didn't uh, hit that 500 mark. Because people typically buy their membership when they come. When they point of sale, when they take out their wallet, it's usually when you can sell them a membership. And then there's your true supporters where you just send them a, a renewal and they, they, they send a check in the mail. But a lot of people like myself, or in this other category where we actually buy our memberships when we go to different places. Is there like a membership goal in the longer term for where um, organizations such as this can be sustaining? Yes, is I mean, like there's all the different layers. What you want to do with membership is if start them at the, sometimes at the bottom if they're at that level, like a family for, you know, $100 or whatever, and then keep bringing them up to, you know, different levels. And, you know, you can cap out on ours, what's it, 2,500 and Big Joe and 1,000 for Flamingo, something, something like that. But there's all these different levels you want to keep bringing people up. And you have your members that just want to help out as a donation because, you know, when you do buy the, the bigger uh, memberships, you're really showing that you believe in the whole the mission and the vision. I meant more like a numerical number, like you had 400. Tom, no, and I mean, you repeat yeah. the question. Yeah, and, and she asked if right we had we had a goal for membership. Of course, the higher the better. I mean, <laughs> you know, when I first started, 500 was mine within a year. You know, it might come close, and then you know, a thousand would be the next, you know, goal. Right, but like, well, 
Well, the as far as I, the botanical gardens is a much larger garden. So what do they have? Thousands of members or something? So well, I know the conservancy. I think has what five thousand or so. Five thousand. So like if we if we could get to a number like fifteen hundred, that would be a pretty good number over the longer term, and we could uh, sustain. The yes, I mean, I would say a thousand would a thousand, be an awesome, a an awesome, an awesome that number was, for that us. That was basically the question. Try to tie the, the number of memberships to covering the operating budget, mm -hmm. kind of a thing. Right. Yeah. Well, just well, more than that, just so that you could be a vibrant organization. So, but you answer the question. I like a, a thousand would be great, and we get to five hundred. Then we can be on, on the coasting side of the effort. Do you think that is true? I think true? Um, once people realize the benefits, like I, I was trying to explain, because I know the benefits. I have uh, two children, and I've belonged to all these organiz organizations for 20, 30 years as far as Fairchild, Selby, and all the different zoos, Lowry Park Zoo or Miami Metro Zoo. And in the reciprocity program, you know, it's definitely an economic decision for families to make. Otherwise, you'd be paying, you know, hundreds of dollars to, at each place. And then uh, grants, um, we're going to engage a grant writer soon. We kind of postponed this. I really wish, um, you know, had, there was more minutes in the day to really focus on grants. I'm, you know, I have to, you know, come clean here. I'm, I've, I'm at 100% with receiving grants. I've only written one grant since I've been there, and I, I got it, and I wish I had more time. But you know things will settle down now, and then if we can engage a real grant writer as well to really put the stuff together. I'm the idea person that feeds the grant writer. Okay, Jackie McCurdy. At the uh, retreat, we talked about this, and uh, Peg and I are meeting with uh, Susan Bridges, who is an excellent grant writer at the Center for the Arts. And uh, she has said that uh, she will help us. Oh, great, great. Uh, telling us how to go about it, what to do, what to look for. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that we will uh, get a lot of information from her as well. And uh, last year's grant from the, the Visitors Bureau in Lee County, we, we put toward a video and a website, which is still in progress. We've spent the money, but it's still not a finished product, but it should be finished soon. And then today, at um, this afternoon, I'm going to get a $15,000 check from the VCB for this upcoming year. And I, I wrote this one where it would give us more flexibility, where it wouldn't be tied to a video or a website, where it would be more for promotion of special events. And what they're really interested in is what they say heads and beds and shoulder seasons. So those are the, the terminology you need to use to, to get these grants. And as we become more of a destination, because that's why I think a lot of people don't realize about the Wonder Gardens. It's not something you're cutting through town and you pull over and get out anymore. It's people decide they're going to come here before they even you know, get in their car. So it is a destination. And as you heard, people from all the way from the Keys were waiting us, for us to reopen. And so that's the type of stuff that the VCB loves to hear, that people, that it is the destination. And there's more to do in uh, this area than beaches, that there is kind of an oasis downtown. And then, you know, these are things on the radar, but, you know, once we meet with different people, like Jack was saying, then we can get these where we can uh, put it all together and get these grants in before the, the deadlines. And uh, business partners, this is something we've been working on, but it's been on the back burner. Hopefully, we'll bring it back to the forefront starting in January, really getting the business community involved so they can see that it's very beneficial for them to be supportive of the Wonder Gardens. And uh, we have some like um, Ace Sunshine, Ace Hardware, where they, you know, they already support us in a lot of different ways. And so we want other businesses to kind of jump on board and see that, you know, it, it is something that'll be a benefit to have their staff, you know, have memberships where they can come in at any time, or just in general, you know, work with us to uh, promote them at the same time they promote us. And then. Um, Earn revenue is, you know, we're very unusual. The Botanical Garden, I think, in Naples is pretty low on the spectrum as far as earned income toward their operation budget, where Naples Zoo is really high. And we're actually, uh, the museum I was at in Durham, we were at 1.93% earned income toward operating, which is like phenomenal. And so we're in a great position where, 
we're almost there, you know, where we're almost, you know, neutral with uh, the money coming in through gate receipts and the gift shop and, and different programming, you know, summer camps or these, even these class kits. It all adds up to where you uh, goes toward your operating budget. And so that number we know will hopefully go higher with uh, exciting new exhibits and then rental opportunities. The summer camps alone can be a huge revenue source. And then you can see, you know, we're, you hear some of the numbers, but, you know, Wes will touch on some more later. But we, we're hoping, you know, this is my thing where you have to be careful not to over promise and under deliver on, you know, increased attendance and sales. You know, I'm hoping with all the new immediate attention and just all the attention that we're getting and, um, the forgiveness of the debt and all these things will help us become more sustainable so we can reinvest and have more dynamic exhibits and more uh, beautiful landscaping and then more product in our gift shop. And uh, right now our product in our gift shop is a little low because this is your kind of your low, you know, your season where the tourists weren't coming in droves. And so now we're going to build up and start having more things available in the gift shop. Tom, <clears throat> two, two things. Uh, have you thought about, for Speaking example, have you thought about going over to like Barefoot Park where there's a ton of visitors? Is there any way you can get some advertisement and brochures over there? I haven't thought about because that's in a different county, right? Barefoot Beach? What do you mean by? Barefoot Beach. It's, okay, yeah, it's I'll look into Park. it. I know um, there's thousands the director of, of parks for there. Collier County, so I'll see if that's something yeah. with. No, I'm, I'm talking about the park, the yeah, one. Collier County Park. Yeah, the one that the new tourism center is being built. Oh, you know. oh um, yeah, uh, Lover's, Lover's Key. Key. Lover's, Lover's Key. Key. Okay, yeah, definitely there we'll, we'll get our brochures there. Well, I would even have like a placard or any, any and changing, change yeah. it periodically. Yeah, so if that is that, that's a state run facility? In Benita Springs. Okay, yeah, yeah so I know With a lot the of the, Myers address. the state folks, yeah. so we'll see what we can do. Right, and then could you speak a little more about what goes on in these camps that you're talking about? I, I'm getting into educational program and what I want to do right now is um, Dr. Hagen's going to touch on the, the, the kits right now but the camps what we did we had a you know a, a certified educator teach the camps and there's about a dozen children most of them were uh, vetted through the Benita assistance office because I was able to with different people in the community get them covered as far as having scholarships and so, you know, it's a lot of activities, whether it's outside or inside. They went to field trips to Artist Naples. They went to Barefoot Beach. They went all over the place. Where a lot of opportunities where these children normally wouldn't have. Because my kids did all the, the camps in Collier County, and we were taking them to those places anyway. But this is a rare opportunity for a lot of these children that are, you know, come more from an indigenous background where they don't go to the beaches and they don't go to the Artist Naples. So. It was really great to see them exposed to animals. They got to hold a lot of different wildlife. But I, I, what I'm looking for, I thought you <coughs> indicate, <coughs> indicated <coughs> they would be a source of revenue. So. Oh, yeah. It's still a source of revenue because people are sponsoring them. You oh. know, they pay $150 to sponsor the child. So there was paying a, a, a guest as well, or, a child, or campers, I guess is what we should call them. And so it was a good blend of paying and scholarship, but, but each one of them, their spot was worth $150. And it's money that we might not have raised otherwise, that people you know, adopt a child, just like Beth will go on about um, the, the class kits are where you can adopt a kit. So it's the same philosophy that it's earned revenue. So like out of the 150, how much was netted for the center operation itself? Well, we were averaging about you know, 10 per week or so for at six weeks, and so it, it added up. And then we hope this year, the way the winter break uh, starts, it's not a good for winter camp. I think the last day of school is like the 22nd or 23rd, and so there's really no way to do a, a winter camp. If it was more like the 17th, we would have that week before Christmas, but we'll do a spring break camp, and then hopefully next year do a, a like a winter break as well. But it's a good earned revenue because we already have the building and the classroom and the, the staff on board. So you're, you know, it's almost all pure profit as far as, um, you know, you already have the lights on basically. 
So you want to touch on the? <coughs> sure, I'd be happy to. Um, an important component she, of the mission. Say your name. You can, oh, you grab that one. It's portable. The big one. There. Say your name. Beth. <coughs> I'm Beth Hagen, and I'm a volunteer uh, at the Wonder Gardens, have been for about a year. An important component of the mission of the Wonder Gardens is education, and environmental education in particular. So we have taken um, a two-part approach to that. We have an on-site program that was developed a year ago and now will be held for the second time, and we're actually doing that with the city of Bonita Springs. It's a Florida Landscaping Expert Certification Program. Uh, it meets four times, three hours per meeting, so they have 12 hours for landscaping committee members from gated communities who want to better understand the issues of landscaping in Florida that might be very different from what they're used to up north. Uh, that sells out within 24 hours. We only have room for 50 people. And um, at the end of the program, they receive a certificate of completion, and they're knowledgeable then about what the city, for example, is looking for in tree replacement of uh, when oaks are removed and the various uh, rules uh, for landscaping in gated communities. But the major component of our environmental education um, initiative is the development and distribution of class kits. These kits are, um, were created in conjunction with Florida Gulf Coast University College of Business um, curriculum development class. And the students there created 11 kits based upon things that are found in the Wonder Gardens, flamingos, alligators, palm trees, and so forth. We took those 11 kits and we made them reproducible and so that it was easy to create additional copies of each kit. And we broke them down into K through two and three through six grades. All of the kits are based on the Florida Sunshine Standards. So teachers check them out and use the lesson plans, materials, posters, thumb drive, crayons, scissors, um, originals for activities in their classroom, meeting their regular educational goals. So it's not something that's in addition to what they, are, what they have to teach. This is an active learning method that um, enables students when they've taken the unit from the class kit through their teacher, to come into the Wonder Gardens with two free tickets per class to have a hands-on activity in the Wonder Gardens. And the result of that hands-on activity can be submitted by any of the children in any of these classes for a contest that would be, will be um, judged at, in, by Enchanted so that the winners can receive a free family membership for, the, uh, for their for a year. The teacher of the class that that student comes from um, in the four categories of the contest also gets a free membership. So it's a way to bring people who might not normally come to the Wonder Gardens into the Wonder Gardens. The other um, advantage <coughs> of this, besides it being sort of a lesson in a, in a box, is that uh, people like to adopt <coughs> these. Um, so for $100, you can adopt a class kit. And the individual's name who adopted the kit is placed on the lid of a kit uh, and left there so that as the teachers are checking them out, and the teachers are checking them out now, I'm happy to report, um, they can see that this particular kit was adopted by whatever the name happens to say. So we've had, um, I believe, $1,600 in revenue generated since we started uh, this adopt a kit program, and um, <coughs> we look forward to that being an ongoing fundraiser that doesn't cost us anything because there's no cost involved in um, having somebody adopt a kit. And it's in the five county area, sir. And it is the five county area. The, the, um, the marketing list that we have uh, are all the schools in the five county area, K through six. The next step, and with Peg's help, we're delighted that Peg has joined the, the board, is the high school version of this, which is based <coughs> upon unit kits that are um, using live webcams in habitats in the gardens. So the first unit kit that is under development right now is about flamingos. So a science teacher in a middle school or high school can use the materials for the lessons and their students can sign on the internet 24 seven 
and observe the animals in their natural habitat. And at various times, but specified times, there will be activities that they will all sign on to look at, the feeding of the flamingos, let's say, or the, the um, I wish we had a picture of the flamingo roundup when you were returning the flamingos to their <laughs> pond after the storm. <laughs> it was like a rodeo. Um, but things like that will be scheduled for people to see. Yeah. Students. It's also available for homeschool. That's correct, I'm sorry, I left that out. Um, not only do teachers use this, but we've had, we have two out now, two parents who homeschool. And they love this idea because they can take their kid and come into the gardens and have their classes right in the gardens. So the homeschooling component of this um, is an important component. And we're about to launch that marketing effort. We really, we started with the teachers and now we're, we're having a, um, a homeschooling day, including a picnic that we had to postpone because of Irma, but that will take <coughs> place in January. Any other questions? Thank you, Beth. And it works well with, you know, trying to bring the children here is one of the challenges because the field trips have been cut at schools. And so this, you know, it's part of our outreach where we can reach a lot of children mm -hmm. that we normally couldn't reach. And, you know, we continue to do outreach. Like this weekend, I'm at the Nature Festival up in Charlotte County and, and just let people know about it. And then if you, the more teachers you can touch and have them excited about, then they'll fight to have field trips back at the Wonder Gardens. Because I, some of my volunteers that were up in Charlotte County, she was a teacher at Immokalee Elementary. And she said, back in the day, you know, she was there for 27 years. They, even from Immokalee, they came to the Everglades Wonder Gardens from over from Collier County as a part of a field trip. So we hope to revitalize that uh, the buses start coming back. But anyway, I touched on the summer camps, and that was one of the most rewarding things because it's utilizing the space that's kind of empty during the summer, but at the same time to see all these children, you know, getting to touch snakes and baby alligators and just meet all the different birds for the very first time is, you know, pretty exciting. It makes it all worthwhile. Again, you know, I talked about community outreach. We've we got a really strong relationship with FGCU. They, a lot of their graduates have to do 80 hours of uh, community service, and then they have a colloquium class where they have to do 10 hours. And so we're getting a lot of those um, students that come there for the first time. And then a lot of them say, well, you know, I'll, even after I get all the hours, I'll still keep volunteering, but they, <laughs> they get busy with their lives. And, but at the same time, though, we, we know we've touched them and, and exposed them to volunteerism. And then um, the Boy Scouts have been very active, and you know, even during the hurricane cleanup, we, we must have had you know six different scouts during that time. And um, anyway, we continue to keep progressing, you know, try to keep a lot of the things that we had in the past, and then add new things to the, the community outreach and then uh, the programming that we do. And you know, we're forever you know grateful to the city of Bonita Springs, of course, and. Especially, you know, Carl, you know, he, I know I drove him crazy with the debris pickup, but that was crucial for us to be successful for Bruce for the birds and family fun day. And do you know how many truckloads were taken yeah. out of there? Is there a number? Well, <laughs> but it must be, but it might be like 50 or six, I sw because I saw some of it and I couldn't believe, not like how little debris they got in a truck, but how many trucks it took to take that debris away. <clears throat> and some of our trees were just massive. Some, the, the machine couldn't even pick them up. But anyway, we continue to you know, look for different partnerships. And the, the one I'm excited about is the Benita Bay Garden Club. I get, I'm gonna go there tomorrow and give them an update of kind of the state of the garden. And then um, <clears throat> recent projects. Um, you know, before Hurricane Irma, we, were, we, we had a lot of things painted and cleaned up, and then we kind of had a, it was a wrong uh, week to put in new uh, zoysia grass, but it doesn't look terribly bad right now. And it was donated by Baron Collier Companies, and going back to get more sod right now is not something that is possible. Everyone needs new grass everywhere. So we're, you know, very excited about all the, things of repainting and all that no matter what you know the hurricane couldn't blow away the new paint so and then we opened some new animal exhibits um if you get to see the 15-foot burmese python that's well worth a visit because 
the reason it was exciting because I saw at the Florida Aquarium how people would kind of gather around the big snake. So we just needed one giant snake that um, get people talking about the, the Burmese python and also the Everglades and how they're intertwined. Now what I want to touch on is some of the, the, the ex exhibits that we hope to do over the next couple of years. And um, one of the things that um, I'll touch on a lot is the pollination pavilion, but the new flamingo experience is kind of in the works. Um, everyone just loves the new flamingo lagoon. It was a rare opportunity to make the island bigger and clean out the muck and add some flowers around it. And you know that concept I'll go in a, a little bit more, but it's a, kind of a work in progress. We, we weren't planning to do all that, but you know we had the opportunity to make some adjustments there. But it's going to be even even better, you know, within a year or so. And I think you have on your printout some of the costs of some of these things. But these are all the things in the year that they're attached to. And the the biggest expense ones would be the pollination pavilions, even though they were donated. And they're they have like a almost like a hundred thousand dollar value right now before we even get, you know. To assembly and um, and then a donor to help us erect them. And but whatever donors come forward, they're going to get incredible value because we've already put a hundred thousand dollars into them as far as they're worth, as far as the the donation involved. Not that we had to pay; it was in kind. And then here's some other things, and I'm going to touch on each one quickly. And these are kind of their target dates right now. These are all like new to the board, so they're probably <laughs> got some questions as well. But I'll touch on it. Again, here's the python. It's over 200 pounds, so it takes two or three people just to, to pick it up. And uh, we want to do a couple things coming up in thanks, or, uh, November. We're hoping to get wild turkeys. We already have them on reserve, and they'll be here in time for Thanksgiving. And then a we'll white peacock male for Christmas, because we want a white Christmas. And I never understood the attraction to white peacocks, but every time I go to Bush Gardens, there'll be 100 flamingos, and everyone's taking a picture of the white peacock. <laughs> and so there's some attraction to it that I don't get. We got some new baby alligators, and we're hoping to get a, a crocodile soon, too, before the year. There's Thomas, I think one of the things we talked about was having the mayor pardon the turkey. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have to get that in the mayor's schedule to pardon the turkey. <laughs> and um, we were going to pardon them anyway, but <laughs> we'll make it official. And then the, the big thing that I'm excited about is the pollination pavilions is kind of what they're known as now. These are all just kind of draft names. Nothing's in uh, concrete. Sometimes donors will decide what they might be called. And um, these are the. This is the actual solarium that's at the Denver Botanical Garden. I was very fortunate to find one assembled online. Somehow through Pinterest, I you know, was just Googling, Googling, finally got to the exact model and then had to tell them that they were from Paris, France. On their website, they, had, they said they were from England. So, and then they said, whoops, we knew they were from Paris. I don't know how it, you know, it says England on our website. And so their staff has put them together, so maybe the Denver Botanical Garden folks wouldn't mind coming here in the winter and help us put together one, because we have directions how to put them together, but no one's actually, you know, no one locally, of course, hasn't done Thomas, it. Thomas, why don't you repeat how these came our way? Uh, these came our way. These are four solariums that are uh, 28 feet by 14, 4, 17 feet high, and they can be glass, but I doubt if we'll go the glass way. We have all the glass. And um, Naples Botanical Garden, they were offered to them by uh, Mark Goodman Group, who builds high-rise uh, residential units for retired folks. And uh, he had passed away, it's going on two years now, and he wanted them at his high-rise down on Davis Boulevard, <coughs> and then another one in Largo, Florida. And um, he, his son took over the company and didn't you know, want to integrate them into their uh, landscape. He wanted to build more high rises. And so uh, Naples Botanical Garden thought about it long and hard, and then they decided they weren't going to use them. So they, they called me, and I was relatively new. And you know, I saw the huge opportunity to, to get them and do some things I've done in the past as far as pollination pavilions. And so um, people on the board, Linda Gutschel's company, Best Moving, moved them from the different locations 
because that would have been an expense right away, a few thousand dollars to get them moved. So we had all the structures moved in kind and they're still in their, their wooden crates from Paris, France. Right. But the exciting thing is they were made for Collier County hurricane standards. So they're, you know, very tough and they were handmade, you know, Paris, France, they're real steel. And here's kind of the concept, you know, one out of every three bites that we take, we can thank a pollinator. So we want to hit that home as far how, how important edu or, uh, pollination education is. And it gives us, um, I'll, if you can't see the thing, it gives us the opportunity to put them along the river and then also do a tea house up on the, the roadside on Old 41 Road. And when people over at Riverside Park or even come across the bridge, they'll see these brand new exhibits that you know definitely are kind of Victorian world class or not world class, world's fair type of architecture that'll really excite people. Because you know when I was at the, the the big art festival downtown, you know I could you know see the Wonder Gardens from that angle, but you you couldn't really see anything. This would be mm. kind of a lure to bring people back, and every time they go across the bridge to see you know, a very classy, well put together uh, structure. But at the same time, have a very important educational exhibit in there that's going to be beautiful. But at the same time, people learn a lot about. And um, so I'll touch on each one. So the different themes for each one, there's four of them. Butterflies and orchids, everyone loves those. Those are kind of a no-brainer. And, um, but the trick with butterfly houses is <clears throat> butterflies only live a week to 10, 10 days. So you have to get new shipments every week or every two weeks. So you don't, a lot of people try to raise their own, but it's just not feasible. So what you do is you get new shipments. And the joke was when I was at Naples Botanical Garden, we got them from East Naples. We got our butterflies FedEx from East Naples to Naples. <laughs> and they would go to Memphis and back down to us. Because <laughs> otherwise, if you sent a person or a car, it would cost you, you know, hundreds of dollars. But, you know, shipping butterflies, um, you know, it's like uh, $25 or so for a small box. Well, it's probably gone up since then. <laughs> And then, you know, like I said, everyone loves orchids. So it's such a, this is all about, at the same time, not the education, come up to the photo opportunities that will be, you know, there with the butterflies. And then another thing that I've done a couple times is the honey creepers, showing the, the, the connection between beautiful plants like that, that are bird pollinated. And, um, you know, again, incredible photo opportunity. And then lorikeets, I've done these before. These are a big money maker because people buy the, the little nectar cups and then the birds land all over you and then you get your you know, pictures like this, which are priceless. And again, they're an important pollinator, believe it or not. And then uh, this one won't take up a whole conservatory, but a side thing talking about you know, lizards that even pollinate the largest seed in the mm -hmm. plant kingdom, the coca de mer or the love nut, which that little boy is holding. And I remember when I got a love nut in Durham, North Carolina, it made all papers below and above the fold. <laughs> and it's just because of the name I picked. It's called the Coca de Mer, but I went out on a limb and got permission from the CEO to call it a love nut. <laughs> and everyone was interested in the Bob and Sherry show, and so it added a whole new uh, excitement to it. But these beautiful things like the Geico lizard, they actually pollinate plants, believe it or not, and these islands where there's not too many different birds. And then incorporating the whole pollination theme, we'd have a live um, beehive inside. And at my previous position, I did honey for the harbor, so we'll do honey for the gardens, where we made a, you know at least $3,000 net to selling honey. Not from that particular hive, but you get from other beekeepers. Because a lot of people really want their local honey right. now, and we can have all the varieties and you know kind of be <coughs> honey central. But same time, again, it's about pollination and then children this little beehive thing like that, they're only like $150 to get that. So it'll pay for itself over and over. And what you do is you have the bees inside and there's a tube that goes outside and they go fly about pollinating everything. No one gets stung. Because <laughs> that's what everyone's concerned again. But the great opportunity, and this was, a, this was more like Trish and different people, you know, I'm more about exhibits and animals and plants. And they kept saying, oh, you need a tea house. And so, the culmination of all the, the solariums is, you know, you're talking about pollination, one out of three bites you take, and then it, the tea house, you know, tea, coffee, vanilla, chocolate, everything that you love, everything you can relate back to a pollinator. So that kind of hits at home, you know, what we're going to do in the tea house is probably unclear at this point, but the good thing is um, Denver Botanical Garden has lots of weddings in it. They can set right. up to 48 people. This right. is the actual tea house inside. 
Nice. You know, so you can do more of the formal experience for a rental or you do the, you know, kind of more the, the church style wedding. And then, you know, the other exciting thing is, you know, we have a new artist in the Everglades um, uh, Wildlife Gallery. And then it just makes it more dynamic to keep rotating different artists out. And uh, Mark's uh, specialty is birds, so it's good to debut him for Bruce with the birds. And so we'll revisit, have a meet and greet on the first uh, December and Friday. And then here's kind of the breakdown of the, um, you know, the, the structures. You know, we honestly don't know what the naming opportunity is, but even if you bought it, put your name on $100,000, I mean, that's, that's how much they're worth, right? You know, right now in the box. So we got to see, you know, what, because whoever does it's going to get an incredible deal. And again, you know, they're going to go along the river here, and then the tea house would be right, you know, facing the road just south of the, the Welcome Center. And Tom, Thomas, it's fair to say that the, the naming opportunity would be to have it installed, up and running, and cover a period of the operational expenses for it. Right. So we, we would have to evaluate that on a per install right. basis. Because the, the they need to be paid for essentially to to recoup that money and sustain them for a period of time. And the most expensive one to run would I have a breakdown of these, but it would be the butterflies because the live shipments of butterflies and then rotating out flowering orchids, and so you can see you know the butterflies alone would be pretty expensive, but it pays for itself in the admissions for sure. Because I was in the kind of the butterfly business for a while and everyone in the nation was doing a butterfly house. They were doing them indoors. They were, you know, everybody jumped on the butterfly bandwagon. On the permitting, we may know somebody at the city. Um, it says 50 to 1,000. Yeah, that was this initial meeting kind of off the cuff. You know, I met with different people. You know, you, it, you know, It'd be great if it's free, but you know. Okay. We'll see if we can. But at the same time, this, uh, Waldorf Engineering hasn't placed them. We don't know all the setbacks and things from the river. And so Waldorf Engineering, we're kind of at their mercy because they do in kind and they're really busy right now. Right. So we have to wait at our turn. Again, you know, this is revitalizing the flamingo thing. Uh, um, this Flamingo Lagoon, you know, adding Scarlet Ibis and Roseate Spoonbills, they're all in the same diet. We've upped their diet to kind of like uh, Flamingo Chow now, where they have all the, the ingredients that make them brightly colored, but at the same time, nutritionally, it's better for them. And the Scarlet Ibis and the Roseate Spoonbill are on that same diet. Then everything planted around them would be, oops, would be um, pink. You know, pink flowered trees, pink whatever. Everything's going to be pink. And uh, we've already started going that direction with a few hundred pink cannas around them. Again, that's in the same spot that it's always has. Of it. We had lots of uh, invasive exotic trees that were kind of damaged in the storm. So I took the opportunity to take out a lot of invasive trees while we were, we, you know, while we were closed. And so that really opened up that area. Again, um, different exhibit ideas. I thought it'd be kind of fun to have the alum clubs kind of competing for the different exhibits, the FGCU Eagles. Unfortunately, where the Eagles were going to go, that exhibit no longer exists, but there's some other place that we can um, add the Eagles. And I've looked, and you know, to have an Eagle is like $3.50 a day, so I think that would pay for itself. <coughs> and, um, but at the same time, you know, it's their mascot. We need to update the, the, the alligator experience, um, you know, revisit the bridge. I've been getting quotes on the different bridges. <laughs> Here's a bridge that was from the rendering from Zoo Miami, but it, it's complete, but it really doesn't look like that. It's really a tunnel because, you know, you don't want, I don't know if you can see that, there's like alligators jumping at the kids' feet and all that. <laughs> and I can't believe they put it in their rendering. That was good. And um, so anyway, there's these very safe things. I mean, you, you could never make it wheelchair accessible, but at the same time, children should have that experience. And when at Zoo Miami, I think it, I made it because I'm short, but it was like at five feet, the cutoff literally, and you can go through like a V thing that's very safe and at the same time gives you that element of uh, danger, which people like when it comes to um, alligators. And then, can't forget the Seminoles, and I've under, done enough research 
that the Seminole Cheekies are better than the Miccosukee. <laughs> <laughs> But at the same time, again, you know, getting FSU alum involved, and we can decide how big the Cheeky's going to be. But they're like $27 a square foot to build a Cheeky. And after the hurricane, if you saw all the Cheeky's that were still there, yeah. I mean, the yeah. palm fronds were still at them. So they are pretty uh, neat for rental opportunities, or even like we learned for Bruce the Birds, you know, a place to put the band. And again, you know, not everyone can see it, but the cheeky would go somewhere like over here where the Hall of Wonder was going to go at one point. Um, looking to add the burrowing owls to the gopher tortoise exhibit because they kind of share the same habitats. And, um, but you know, you have to wait for ones that are injured to come available. You know, they get hit by cars or they have issues in Cape Coral where you can get some. And everyone loves owls. And this is, between the eagle and the owls, that's the only place we see going into the, the raptors or the hawks and all that. We would just do what's popular. And then my son went to Florida Atlantic his first year, and that's their mascot. And he was so embarrassed that uh, a burrowing owl was their mascot. <laughs> we thought it was the coolest thing, but we learned later the reason it's the mascot because they built the stadium on burrowing owl habitat. <laughs> and that was the deal they made with Audubon. <laughs> But anyway, they're the cutest things, and you can never get enough burrowing owl pictures. I don't know how many alum are here from Florida Atlantic, but I'm sure there's enough. And then again, we're um, looking at bringing back the crocodile. It's a little bit more complicated you know, than I thought to get American crocodiles. There's kind of a, a monopoly that some one person has on them. Hmm. But we can substitute other crocodile species until we get the American crocodile. Again, it's about explaining the different habitats. This would cover the saltwater mangrove habitat and try to, you know, again, with the alligator experience, which I didn't touch on, it'd be highlighting the Everglades and the freshwater system where this would talk about more of the, the mangrove ecosystems that the American crocodile lives in. And then way down the road, this, I did the research and it, at Moat Marine and stuff. This is very expensive, but very popular, the opportunity to feed um, stingrays and touch them is, um, something that you know maybe in 2020 that we are, will be ready for but very popular and a lot of these things are very oriented toward money making just like the alligator feedings we got the crocodilian biscuits now that we can sell in the gift shop there's 936 in a 50 pound bag and so and the 50 pound bag is $50 so if we sell them for a dollar each we're like way ahead of the game and people will buy it the the quarter machines that we have for feeding the wildlife they make $8,000 a year so that will just add to it to be able to feed more things like that. And then the tortoise touch, where we have the tortoises, I want to create an exhibit where there's not any like true barriers except rocks and poles and things like that. And of course, um, you'd use forceps to feed the tortoises if you want all your fingers. So one of the things I've learned from visiting different zoos, like at Bush Garden stuff, they have the giant Galapagos tortoises that you know you kind of keep your distance with the, you know, with the lettuce and stuff. Otherwise, they can't tell the, the difference between your fingers and the, a carrot. And so we already have these tortoises, and they're pretty big. So that'll be kind of another opportunity to um, sell romaine lettuce to people that want to get up close and personal. And then looking down, we kind of have this um, a prowl that when you come out of the door, you, there was some call cages that I moved to the side so you can see all the way down. And eventually. There's like half a concrete wall and lots of chain link fences, all different colors. And we want to extend that wall out and do some type of mural, you know, that has some thing related to Southwest Florida, whether it's flamingos or alligators or manatees. This is at the Botanical Garden. And when we did that, the, the thinking was that everyone in the community would bring this their broken china and we could add it to the wall. <laughs> <laughs> but people don't even want to part with their broken china. So we had to run to Pier 1 and break, break everything. And then, <laughs> And then at the same time, we um, there's a, a clay artist down there that does fish, and uh, what's his name, Rice. And uh, so we bought some of his stuff and broke it. And he was very offended that we broke his stuff and put it in the wall. But I think it's forever <laughs> a monument. So if you know where I'm talking about, you'll you could picture something to look at, like mm. a long view, and then it ends with the wall before the alligators to the the north and the south. And then the other thing I'm. My wife said, well, do you want to go to St. Simon's for um, Thanksgiving? And I said, well, only if I can revisit St. Augustine Alligator Farm. 
because they do this there. They zip over the gators and the crocodiles, and they bring in a private company that takes care of all the liability and does all the building of it all. And so this has become very popular where you, you zip over different things or have canopy walks. And um, they're very safe, you know, so. <coughs> Um, so I hope to look at that and get the company involved to do that. You know, we did lose a couple trees that would have been important for the zip lining, but I think I rethought it in my head that we could still do this. And maybe even go over to Riverside Park. We're done. And then these are very low um, cost exhibits, you know, enhancing the ones you have. These are very popular where you go with the parakeets and you pay a dollar or two to get a little stick of seeds on a popsicle and then they land all over you. and I saw this at the Aquarium of the Americas last December up in New Orleans or over in New Orleans and you know it was a very sterile environment concrete this and that but the birds just landed on people and they just loved it I mean you can see it, it gets a little crazy with them all at your feet but you you know we'll have volunteers stationed at all these hands-on exhibits for you know the safety of the, the visitor and the wildlife or you know, in consideration, but very inexpensive bird that goes a long way as far as making money. <clears throat> and then we'd do finches on the other side. So this, this is, was gonna be done by now, but Irma pushed us back, but we're working on it right now to make all the exhibits more um, immersive. Again, this is what's gonna happen by the end of the year. The turkeys, you know, I'm still trying to get a gobbler or tom turkey, I have two hens, so I hope the mayor's okay with pardoning females if uh, I don't get the big gobbler, but I'm working on it. And then uh, the python and baby alligators, crocodile, and then the white peacock. Uh, you know, this is a few hundred dollars worth of investments and it'll definitely get that back quickly. And again, here's some prices and years associated, you know, with the, uh, the different uh, exhibits that are kind of in the works. So you can see some are zero cost because we have the animals with their new wildlife consultant have the animals on loan. And um, so that keeps it very dynamic. They can go away and get something else and just keep it fresh. What is the wildlife uh, consultant? It's a great idea, obviously, yeah. rotation. But why do you have them on board? Do you need that? Uh, that the new gallery? No, no, the wildlife Oh, uh, because of the connections they have. Okay. It's the main cool. thing is gotcha. that they can the bring. And the license, and the li of course, so you I, have to have a license. That's what I would have thought. Yeah, yeah, staff can get the license, but you know. It's simpler that way. But this way, even if they had their license, we wouldn't have the availability to get, you know, crocodiles at a drop of a hat or, or 15 foot python. And so this gives us a lot more um, depth as yeah. far as uh, having wildlife. Because we don't want to collect everything there is to collect. Right. We want to just keep, keep it rotating. Like yeah. Naples Zoo is getting penguins right now. And so that's just a temporary traveling exhibit. And so once we get to that point where we can get traveling exhibits come in, you know, whether it's frogs or the rainforest and, huh. or big bugs or whatever, you want to keep it fresh because that's what the VCB and everybody's all about is wanting repeat visitors. Again, you know, very low cost exhibits. You know, the, the flamingos, I've done all the research and know that, you know, they get like 24 new flamingos and a dozen roseate spoonbills and a dozen scarlet ibis would be about $37,000. And then we would have a place for them to go at night. Cause right now it's a risk not putting them away at night. So we got to get to that point where we have them trained where they get locked up every single night. And, um, and once we make that investment of new flamingos, we definitely got to make sure that they're safe at night. And then, um, Alligator experience, new bridge, and all that would be less than $10,000. But you can see some of the bigger ticket items I pushed a little further down. But the other ones we can do right away. Hmm. I mean, we do a lot with what we have, you know, the volunteers, and there's a lot of stuff that they had stored that we can reuse. And then here's some of the, the earned income we hope to bring in through the different things, whether it's children's camps or flaming, I'm, I switched it from Flamingo Fridays to Flamingo Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a typo, but it's a new word. It'll be like Google someday. <laughs> and then, um, you know, all the different things. We're got, we, one of our staff is certified yoga instructor, so we're in December going to start with yoga and, and stick with it. It's not going to cost us a lot because she's already on staff. 
but you know it takes a while you can't just do yoga and then a month quit later because no one signed up you just stay at it anyway oh i'm there That's great <laughs> so um so anyway if there's any questions you know i'll be here until the last person leaves i imagine well thank you thomas that was fabulous I really appreciate thank it you. <laughs> mike did you want to say anything in context as to liaison I'm good right now. Okay. All right. Council, any questions about or comments? I just had to work. Here you go. Somewhere here. I got it. All right. Uh, is there such a thing as really as a bullfrog? Because I, I like your idea of, of connecting some of these animals with mascots. And we have a bullfrog is our high school. <laughs> I didn't know if there really was a bullfrog. <coughs> what they're talking is that is it bull shark. Bull shark. Bull shark. Oh, bull shark. okay, yeah. Bull shark. Oh, they're all bull frogs. They're they bull should shark. have been the stingrays, but exactly. Well, but yeah. maybe we can I'm still sorry. change that. Bull sharks are probably is, difficult to have. What are <laughs> I mean, I, the ten-year plan is maybe aquarium and a sea yeah. turtle hospital, and manatee hospital, but right now that's. And I don't know if you could work into it or it would be useful to you because. We are trying to get a webcam for our eagles in River Park, and maybe you could get a monitoring station, if that would be. Yeah, good. we were thinking about a flam yeah. cam to yeah. show the flamingos. Yeah. Uh, for the eagles during that, uh, because. Oh, you want us to be able to be able to yeah, see like, the Yeah, because we're supposed to have eagles. a webcam, so mm -hmm. uh, it's not there, but we have a nest, and they obviously they're nesting now, so it would, it'd be good for people to look at it, and it would give us recognition for River Park. Um, uh, but uh, you did a great job, and I, I'm really excited to see some of these things come to fruition. I love the little houses. Thank you. <laughs> Steve, yeah, you can get a mic on. Yeah, uh, Tom, I have three questions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you have approximately uh, over, a little over 100 volunteers, and I know they come and go. Are you able to maintain over 100 volunteers on a regular basis? Well, that's what we have. You know, of course, the empathy boat we had after Irma, so we had 200 new volunteers, and uh, so we have a volunteer coordinator, so it's keeping them engaged. We have a thanks for giving that's coming up the Thursday after Thanksgiving. It's a tr tradition I do at every, whatever nonprofit I'm at, where we. It's an open house, and at the same time, you know, saying mm -hmm. thank you to the volunteers in court. So that's the the, the, the tricky part is keeping them always engaged because <coughs> their lives get busy, and so sure. it's you know it's it's going to happen, and uh, I doubt we'll keep that momentum of 200 new ones because I think it was a one-time thing because a lot of people couldn't work and there was nothing to do maybe, and mm -hmm. so they wanted to you know stay busy, and so we hope to maybe get them on weekends. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other question is about 15 years ago, I remembered Vanderbilt Lakes, we had a baby gator. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, whoever they was, indicated that they were going to bring it over to the, uh, ever, uh, the park, to Wonderful Gardens. Is that still something that you do? No, I mean, because of license, you can't really accept a lot of things that it could be like a gopher tortoise or American alligator or, or American crocodile because of, you know, it's illegal to, to take those things in. And, Okay. They have to go through the proper channels for the us wildlife to take and it. All that. Right. Okay. And my final question is, uh, if there's a church group, say 20 students that want to go on a field trip and visit, what is the cost of that? Well, we have a special group rate, which um, <clears throat> I believe it's some, it's closer to like $10 for, per person, because per normally per it's per $12. Mm -hmm. The student rate might be different, you know, mm -hmm. closer to eight, don't quote me, but, but a lot of times mm -hmm. I even waive those because one of the things we had lots of field trips from very like east of here type of children and they made the executive decision to let them in for free and they ended up spending like two hundred dollars in the gift shop and so oh, okay. you never know you know what good's going to come from letting people in so we're we're very open to you know waiving a mission for the right you can negotiate people. oh yes yeah. well negotiate from free to whatever no i wouldn't, I wouldn't <laughs> want free but that's that's but they usually you know end up being volunteers or mm -hmm. you know you always get get it back yeah. thank you Tom, thomas if they come in in the next uh, what three weeks they are oh free. yes oh, really? children are free for the month of november so <clears throat> Yeah. Did, didn't you say earlier that you could get an eagle for what was it, three fifty a day? Three dollars and fifty cents a day is the food and the maintenance of a, a so one bald eagle. But what's it cost to get the eagle? Oh, they're free because they're they're injured in the wildlife. A lot of these things you can't, you know, legally put like sell them. Right. 
and so we have the right licenses to have them and so we you know this the exhibit has to be so many square feet and you know they come and inspect now one one last one when you when you're count <clears throat> when you're giving us a <clears throat> quote on how many members you have um, that's paying members right right oh yes and um, and that's from every level from fifty dollars to twenty five hundred so that's when we say five hundred members that number can be any number because it's not just a standard rate of the cost of a membership most of them are I would say the hundred dollar size membership which is family Peter are you up there in the cloud uh, I was wondering whether he's all right. <laughs> um, I had, a, I had a, just a few things. One is I think this rotation idea is a fabulous idea because it obviously brings people back and the notion of reaching out to that specialist to come in and rotate. I saw it's where I, I saw Wes and his family right by those pipes. I said, what the heck is this thing? You know, I mean, I, you know, and I think yeah. that's part of the wonder of it, right? Um, mm -hmm. Second thing is um, getting money from the uh, VCB is a, you know there's a lot you went through I mean there that was so impressive it said sometimes some of the even more impressive things kind of get buried in like the hundred things you were showing us mm -hmm. all good things getting money from the VCB is a big deal it's a big deal um, and getting them west of uh, west of 41 is, is right, a big right. deal so uh, I just wanted to make that point and last one is actually I wanted to double down on what Fred was talking about. Lover's Key has close to a million, people don't wow. realize, close to a million visitors a year. Yeah. It's actually part of the reason for the traffic, but, right. they, but it's a high class problem, okay. Um, so I, I know, I'm sure Trish knows Mark Generalis and you know, uh, I mean, getting closer to them and I don't know what the numbers are, but a lot have to be people from outside the area. Just, you know, have to be, so. <coughs> Money from the state to pull the yeah, no, but, we, we, but somehow we, connecting. Yeah. We do like uh, Beach and the Beauty before, because yeah. you know, everyone goes to the beach tourists and they get sunburnt the first day, and the right. Wonder Gardens is a perfect oasis because you know, it's, there you go. it's, after it's, it's fairly it's shady even after the hurricane. Yeah. That they they kind of you know get lathered up with aloe and need a cool place right. to, <laughs> to go. Anyone from the board like to add anything or say anything about it? It's really impressive presentation. The other thing I didn't touch on because you know this right. was already 60 slides is what we did in Collier County. We got traveling exhibits. We got dinosaurs. We got all these different things right. that really kept it fresh. And so hopefully I'm working with Tamara at the VCB. They have all the base. We have baseball stadiums in Lee County that eat up that traveling exhibit money where they normally right. would give to museums right. and such. But but she's open to it because you know we could do some low cost traveling exhibits right. during shoulder season for like fifty thousand dollars whether it's big bug big bug sculptures or dinosaurs what have you and that really brings them from the five what county is, area um, do you know offhand what naples zoo or botanical garden get from collier vcb when i was at the naples garden or naples we were getting about a half million dollars a year yeah, exactly and so it was good play money for exhibits exactly yeah. so more trips to fort myers the better right yeah <laughs> Um, Trish? Peter, I was just going to say, um, <clears throat> Trish here, the Benita Stero Board of Realtors at their upcoming dessert auction has, um, <clears throat> is going to be donating $1,000 to the Wonder Gardens as part of the proceeds <clears throat> and also the Estero Chamber of Commerce during their Christmas party is going to donate a portion of their 50-50 to the Everglades Wonder Gardens. So what it's saying to me is that there's more people that we are reaching <clears throat> out to or more people reaching into us from outside of the Benita Springs area which is really nice. Okay. Is there more to the presentation? That's all we have. Okay. So now, it's now I can pass around the concept book for right. people to plan the, the only thing that is not in the presentation, and it's because at the advice of our CPA, we don't have audited financials to disclose. It's not the right time to do it. Okay. But I can answer questions if there's right. any questions. Well, I think it'd be helpful to pick up on this, start with this 70% point that was up on the slide, mm -hmm. right? And how are you feeling about things? So I don't know that I can get into exact percentages, but um, I pulled some numbers. And we did have a slide put together. But again, I, I decided to remove it. Okay. Um, 
looking at, and, and these numbers, what I did in order to give a, a very um, uh, clear picture of where we are cash-wise, I took out in-kind donations, things that weren't cash-driven, things that, um, and I also took out things that were capitally um, you know, used for us to repay debt. So, so any, any of that money, this would be a, a picture of what we look like um, in what we hope to be the future with the city as a partner. Um, and, and just looking at the last 12 months, our um, previous November through April, um, we had unrestricted donations in the neighborhood of $117,000. That's your memberships, partnerships, um, donations that came from our events that weren't necessarily um, and I'm using very round numbers here, but yeah. they're going to get to the bottom line. Um, so that's that's everything not capitally in, in, uh, brought in, primarily memberships, grants of about thirty-eight thousand. You say not capitally, you mean as part of a fundraising drive? Well, they were fundraising yeah, money, but, but they but weren't you. They weren't capital, brought in for, cap, for capital for, for what we called our capital. I'm sorry, because on the board we use capital. That was our money to repay the city of Benito. Oh, okay. Yeah. So when we brought when we talked <laughs> about capital, we weren't fundraising for. Uh, these structures, okay. we, we couldn't do that. Okay. We, didn't, we knew that that debt. was, we had to get past the, the, debt. the, the debt first. Right. Um, grants uh, income was $38,000 last year. Um, during the period, I'm talking November through April. Our year end is April, so these are gonna be two chunks we're gonna look at. Um, events, uh, and again, this is our ticket sales for events, so there was donations at Thank the events care. that were not included here. <laughs> But our event ticket sales about thirty six thousand um, dollars, and then our admissions and gift uh, shop, and this also includes mm -hmm. our flower sales, and some smaller things that happen on site. Um, the uh, eight thousand dollars of alligator uh, feed and the quarter uh, mm -hmm. machines um, was one hundred eighty five thousand dollars. So for that period of time, beginning April of twenty sixteen through uh, um, November of twenty sixteen through April twenty seventeen. Our income was three hundred seventy-six thousand dollars. Your, your revenue. Revenue, sorry. Yeah. Um, and then our uh, expenses were two hundred fifty-four thousand hmm. dollars. So we had a net profit of one hundred twenty-two thousand dollars. Okay. <coughs> so Mayor, yeah. and it's not. It's ten. It's not the rotary. <laughs> so obviously that's the story. I'm in business. It, you know, this period of time is where we all have to pad our bottom line because the next period of time is going to be the last six months or the May through October. And this includes October and I'm still getting some uh, numbers put into October, but this is as of last night. Right. Um, and this, so this includes Irma, this includes recovery um, expenses and, and, and all of the above. Um, unrestricted donations, again, your memberships and things like that, $47,000. We had no grant income. Um, Admission and gift was $82,000, events about $5,000. Uh, rental income, and I put the rental income in this number because frankly there's a lot of rental expense as well, so this number isn't necessarily a positive um, net of expenses. But that rental income was about $9,000 for a total um, revenue of $143,000 and expenses during that same period were $219,000 for a net loss during the period of $76,000. And what period that, that's this? That's May through October. So that's I'm giving you this as, the as a, including, including the hurricane. Including the hurricane. Right. So our total last 12 month rolling cycle, right. we're positive about $46,000. With the hurricane in there. With the hurricane included. Okay. And there, I think what I would say is these numbers are, that's in, in, in essence $519,000, $520,000 in, in revenue during that period of time. When we first took on the, um, as a nonprofit, the Wonder Gardens, I think our initial year's budget was around $350,000 in revenue. So this has been a, a progressive growth, right. even in spite of um, you know, the expenses that we thought we had and the new, the changes in the mm -hmm. board's newness to the property, we have, we've steadily grown and I'll give Thomas and his team a, a huge amount of yeah. credit. And, and, and also the fact that, you know, a lot of this last year, you know, there was construction on the roads, there were things that were impacting what we believe to be our true potential, um, Hurricane Irma as well. 
And uh, so I think these numbers are something, as a board member, I'm proud of. Right. And, um, and, and I think it shows that we have a really bright future in the next 12 months, regardless of, whether, of, of how much of this um, is accomplished. And I know things are already being accomplished, so I'm sure they will only help. Thank you. Any Wes, questions? is it true that we, I think our comps for September, October, is we lost 61,000 in gate receipts compared to last year? Does that sound right? Okay, that, that, that's what about 30,000 a month is lost in earned in revenue because of the Hurricane Irma. Any questions? Can we um, talk a little bit about kind of a macro question, which is, uh, and you've which is, what do you see the facility, for lack of a better word, looking like in three years, five years? So you've touched on a lot of it mm -hmm. in connection with the programmatic descriptions you've talked about. But can we talk about that a little more and what that I mean. Well, you know, one of the challenges is, you know, we, we have an outdated facility as far as pretty much everything there as far as the, the man-made part of it. And so bringing that up, to where it's you know easy on the eyes or aesthetically pleasing and you know lots of flowers definitely helps soften it and you know I see bringing in you know a system where we one of our biggest labor outputs is trying to keep the water clean because all these systems where you have animals defecating in water and sun creating algae and I mean it's very challenging yeah. and you know aquariums <coughs> and different zoos you know, they have tens of thousands of dollars, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of UV filtration devices, and we have whatever we could right. kind of put together, right. whether it was from someone's pool, and, and then you have to drain them. There's not like a plug you pull, you gotta like bail them out or sump them out, and so there's all those challenges, but you know, ultimately, we want it to be a place that keeps that the historic past, you know, the, the epicenter where you come in and you have that feeling of old Florida. At the same time, we got to modernize the, the workings of it, the plumbing. And, you know, I know there's grants out there through the water district and things like that. But, you know, we got to figure out, we got to have a plan for that. I would say that it's not one of the sexy things to buy, but it's something that ultimately will give us that fresh, clean water look. Because, right. you know, you always hear about it. But, but you that's, know, that's the, the look of it. Yeah, the I long term is more like everything's connected through streams and boulders and water's moving okay. around All and right. there's a common thread <laughs> and theme. But you know, quickly, you know, right now we're just trying to paint and modernize Understood. it a little bit to kind of give it a fresh look with flowers and orchids in the trees and the new electric, exhibits. The electric, trying to bring the electric up to par as well. Yeah, even for our, our events, you know, our rental income, it were challenged because the electricity wasn't up to code, and so every time something breaks, we have someone, that, you know, we have to bring it up to today's standards, and, you know, it's thousands of dollars instead of $100, and so there are all those type of challenges, but overall, I think we're on the right path of just getting through this season with you know, a few new exhibits and then adding where we can as far as fresh paint. So what I'm, what I'm getting at is uh, you're occupied with the real world out right. of necessity. <laughs> particularly because you had a hurricane. So I'm not presuming that, you know, this would be like presto, changeo, or whatever. But to rephrase my point, it's kind of like, and you and I talked several times mm -hmm. about this, where you say, and you talked about it here, so when you come in, you look down, and there's a vision through a vista, and you talked about, on one of your slides, what that could look like. Um, makes sense to me, you know, mm -hmm. with one person, right? But um, and then in terms of the pavilions, where the pavilions are going to be, and they're obviously beautiful structures. Mm -hmm. um, but my question is, in that context, in other words, are we getting professional? And, and you're obviously very talented. I'm not trying to, uh, you are. All right. mm -hmm. uh, but in that context, are we getting like professional help, opinion, design ideas with respect to holistically how that would fit in three or five years. In other words, well, all right, we're saying put the pavilions over by the river, but how does that fit with respect to how we really want it to look in three or five years? Wes? I I'm only going to step in because I think he's going to be modest, but I mean, this is what Thomas has done in his entire career is create the vision for 
parks Phys like physical, physical vision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I think where the consultants come in is, you know, the. And by the way, Wes, I'm not saying we need a consultant. I'm no, just, I understand. I, yeah. But okay. we we will, and, and right. some of that has to do with the animals because you know that is a new a new aspect of what what we would I think in, in your background is, is is there but we have experts helping there as well okay um, but I don't think we have gotten to a three to five year um, roadmap in my is that fair to say on, only because other than what we're seeing here right, in which terms is of opportunities right. because this meeting and some of the things we've been working on and getting to this point is going to be the springboard for that okay Trish, anything? Any thoughts? No. Yeah. And I have consultants. Okay. Like I got an email, I think, yesterday over the weekend from um, Cindy Tyler out of Terra Designs in Pittsburgh, you know, where she did Chicago Botanical Garden, Missouri, Denver, and Naples. And, you know, they're chomping at the bit to help us, but I've been, you know, keeping them back to let the local community, you know, step forward. Right. Because, you know, through my career at the different, or I've paid all these different people, not me, but the organizations that right. paid them. And so kind of now it's, <laughs> they want to, you know, kind of give back. Nice. And so, but at the same time, you know, Boulder Engineering, they want to get into this Space. business of doing attractions and botanical gardens. Right. And so this is a, a pro bono opportunity that they're excited about. So you know, for example, you've been there, you know, if you go on a website in April's Botanical, you'll see their vision, their physical vision by outfits like that, mm -hmm. you know, nice in terms of what what the aspiration is and what it's going to look like. That's what I'm getting at. And one of the challenges is, um, you know, we're a small staff. Right. And I'm not trying to make excuses, but, you know, I've worked at the uh, Missouri Botanical Garden where they had, you know, 400 employees right. <laughs> and a million visitors. And so you have events staff, you know, that just do rentals. and. Right where we have to wear many hats. Right. Like we're trying to cross train everybody except for me, like with the cash register. Right. And you know, everyone can take care of animals, everyone can take care of plants, everyone can take care of the guests because the most important thing for us is the guest experience. Yeah. But everything has to you know, come together, whether, whether it's a nice looking you know, exhibit or beautiful plants, but overall we want them to have an experience because we were all friendly and we're, we're having the FGCU uh, um, st staff there at the hospitality school help train our staff even be more friendly. So that's all goals that we know are very important. And we've Peter. learned that the word of mouth is crucial. Thank Peter, you. I think that is our three to five yeah. year, three to five year plan. Which is what? That chart that the chart. shows the, the places up, uh, that's our plan. Okay. And if we get that, We've got everything, really. Right. I mean, that is, that is something that uh, Bonita Springs has never had. Right. And now we've got the people behind it. And we have people that have lived in Bonita all their life and came to the two things we had and had never been in the Wonder Gardens. Right. Or never, maybe and they, the couldn't, they couldn't believe right. it. So, I mean, I think you're going to find that in three to five years, we're going to have that. If you look at what we've done in the few years we've been aboard, I mean, there's been a lot of changes and a lot of right. things for the good. The best thing we did was hire Thomas, right. really, because so I, he I'm, is an right. expert. So, and what, I, so what I'm getting at more is what does that look on a storyboard? What does it look like to look at it? In other words, uh, this is all good. This is not. Oh no, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. no. So, in other words, you know that's from the top, but a vision of when you walk in, what it would look like in front of you. What would the pavilions look like? What would the area looking down look like? I think it'd be great for capital raising. I'm not trying to. Oh no, business, I agree with you. But, I yeah. agree with you. But yeah. I mean, I don't want you to think we don't have. That's our three to five year plan. <coughs> yeah. Debbie Brown. Debbie Brown. Um, perhaps we could use Debbie. some of the. Debbie. Perhaps we could use some of the money we got from the attractions um, to create a virtual walkthrough. Yeah. That exactly. we can show people, we can advertise, and um, I mean, 
just walk through, and this is the vision, this is our vision. Right. And then, then I think that would tell the story. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's more or less what I'm getting at. And I understand because I, I was at Naples Botanical Garden part of the concept team, so when it was finished, <laughs> I had seen it five years ago in my head, right. and that's the hardest part with uh, potential donors. We made 3D models. We had a whole like room, like this size, practically showing people this is what it's going to look like because they couldn't visualize, you know, the end product. And so I, I understand what you're mm -hmm. saying, and we're kind of right now waiting for Waldorf to do renderings because okay. that's important right. too, for them to create these cartoon type renderings. Exactly. That, and videos, now people can make videos that you can't tell if it's real or the future. And so we hope to you know, be there. So it's underway. That's good. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, practically speaking, I think this next 12 months, yeah. um, as, as the current treasurer, I would say mm -hmm. we're not going to be making that next investment in the next 12 months. But I would say that the next VCB grant or um, an opportunity may present itself where, where this can be the money we go out and, and ask for so that we can enhance you know to, to really do the capital fundraising and bring yeah, this a to a point right. concept here, right. 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 and and so i think operationally um one of our big takeaways from our board retreat was um to really lock down the financial and operational um well-being of the organization right. in the short term and some of these more um future looking and um truly necessary uh, things that you're bringing up, and I agree, uh, are, are probably going to be in the, that's probably in our one to two year plan to get that all organized for an opportunity to bring to the public. Well, knowing Thomas, it's going to happen more quickly. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> like, I don't even know what day it is. Right? I'd, I'd like to make a couple of points on what you're talking about. I, I would suggest you explore two or three things. Over at Florida Gulf Coast University and some of the other schools in the area, you're going to find that they have course curriculum where they're doing the computer-generated 3D. Mm -hmm. Now, in every class, there'll be 5 to 10 percent that are really highly talented that you can, you can work with them and give them visions and all that, and they'll kind of put it into, and I think you can get that done <coughs> fairly inexpensively. If you go out and contract with companies that do this for a living, right. you're gonna pay an arm and a leg. Right, and you're that's not why in that I'm position. hesitant to yeah. get And I think involved. the other thing you can also do, in that same group, <coughs> you'll also have a number of students that can knock out renderings of just a, a view here and a view there. Mm -hmm. and start with that and then get some of them recruited to help do the virtual mm -hmm. tour because mm -hmm. that's all possible but you got to have talented students right. that are interested but you can find them. perhaps you can work with the uh, instructor to where they get some extra credits for some of this stuff. yeah my brother's a professor of architecture at Clemson I always wherever I'm at try to engage him but <laughs> I think professors might be procrastinators or but anyway he you know always promises to bring a bus load or a van load of students down for wherever I'm at and and you know well, it's be, about time huh? yeah, yeah now this 3d <laughs> printing and all that you know you can really create good visuals like uh, Forbes councilman Forbes was saying because it is all about people being able to see the vision okay anything Anything else? I was just going to say, so does the sound from, obviously we're different from six months ago, which yeah. is really awesome to see and just to feel it in the room. Yeah. And um, looking, at, uh, looking at where we are today and where we want to head, does it, do you see it f from our vision as well? I mean, do you see the future with us as our stewardship? To say the least, from my perspective, uh, council? Yeah. <laughs> oh, there you go, Amy. I, I have seen a remarkable change from our interaction with the board during what I call the troubles. Uh, and uh, so I'm really looking forward to having some of these things become a reality, and they already are. And uh, I was at the Water Gardens just a couple of days ago because I had been there 
right after the storm and I came back thinking, oh my God, how is this ever going to get over? Uh, how are you ever going to get through this? But it, it is really uh, quite a, a feat that you've done. So I think if you can get that together, you probably can get this together. So I'm very encouraged by it. Um, and of course the city wants you to be successful and it looks like you're going down the right direction. And I just have, uh, I'm kind of the boring person here, you know, because <laughs> I'm always uh, interested in things like electricity and plumbing. Um, so even though it's not sexy to talk about, I hope that that definitely um, is part of the development that you're gonna have over the near term rather than the late, uh, the, you know, the longer term. So um, that, that would be something that I think the board needs to focus on also. Thank you for all your efforts. I really appreciate all the, all the former me uh, board members and all the new ones that are coming on that are making this uh, a really an exciting project. And I, I want to bring up something I mentioned before, but one of the best things you guys can do is get all your lighting converted over to LED because that's going to make that insufficient electrical power supply you got more sufficient. Yeah, right now we basically have Calusa lighting with uh, <laughs> torches and candles. And, I mean, it is so outdated. Yes. But there's going to come a time. Right. All I'm oh, yeah, we definitely, we're going to do it right. We've, Ted from Tektronics, you know, they're, even the, the zoo and the botanical gardens are behind on their lighting, even though they're newer organizations, especially the garden, where the, you know, it makes it so much easier to have functions like our Enchanted, where you can just, plug everything in instead of having 50 generators and cords everywhere. So we're, we're going to invest into the, the infrastructure like that. And yeah. cheaper. Yes, mm -hmm. and I a mean, lot less. An initial investment, but an ongoing right. save. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Carl, any questions? Good? Yeah. Um, public comment? Deborah McLean. Need a mic. You need a mic somewhere. <laughs> uh, I have a question about the burrowing owls. Are they still a protected species? Oh yes. And uh, then I make another suggestion. Mm -hmm. In Cape Coral, there are individual residential lots that have signs on them: "No construction, burrowing owls." I know those owners would be grateful. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a source for this. And the other thing would be, they might pay you. <laughs> okay. uh, the other thing would be uh, the Sarasota School of Art, mm -hmm. as far as your visuals. That's a good it, idea. It is, because I was supposed to go to the School of Art way mm -hmm. back when I was a young person. Anyway, so those are my two suggestions. Yeah, that's uh, the Ringling School of Art and Design is one of the best in the world. So I'm sure there's some talented that's where the Pixar people graduate. I'm having really? a meeting with the president today on something else. So oh. I will bring up Fred's uh, suggestion to him and see what he thinks. And maybe they, if they can't, maybe he has some ideas of how we can. With Dr. Martin at FGCU or at the school? No, no, I'm going oh. to, up oh. to Sarasota. Oh. Good, last call. Any any other comments or any other things? You're sitting there like oh, anxious I've to say. Oh, I've got to run. I'm sorry. Uh, you're sitting like you're anxious to say something. No, I'm anxious to say i got to run. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, good. But I just want to reiterate, thank you to the That's city yes. for having this, and thank you to the board, and thank you to the community for showing the support during this uh, troubled time, you know, not just the troubles that Amy is referring to, but this, you know, the hurricane, I mean, right. That wasn't in our uh, strategic plan to have a hurricane. Right. But, you know, it was, if there was good timing, it was good to have it in mm -hmm. September and October. Yeah. So, but anyway, thank you for uh, letting me have the opportunity to kind of share the vision. It's a draft, but at the same time, it was, a lot of this was new to the board today, too. So. Well, great job. Thank, thank you, you thank all. You. And, um, oh, oh. Jane, you have yeah. I, I just want to say uh, a big thank you to Thomas for his coordinating efforts on getting the gardens back to where they are right now. Because driving by there <laughs> was heart rendering. Mm -hmm. um, being a resident of this city for the last 54 years of my life, um, that was our downtown. And my husband worked there as a teenager. And it was very heartbreaking. And I know that when Thomas walked in there the day after the hurricane, he was ready to walk right back out again. <laughs> um, and it was amazingly overwhelming. <laughs> I 
can't imagine what your feelings were. But I personally want to thank, thank you, you for all your coordinating efforts to get it back to where they are right now. Well, thank Thanks. you. I want to thank, you know, we did a lot of damage to save those trees. So <laughs> they cost us a lot of concrete sidewalks, but we felt like the trees, we couldn't replace them and they were priceless. So we did everything in our power to, you know, get them uprighted again. And believe it or not, they'll, they'll flush out and 10 years from now, you won't even realize. Right. Are, you know, one, so one last question. <clears throat> the big billboard that's oh okay no, what do you call it? <laughs> they're is historic that, hand painted murals no, is <laughs> that is that your property or this well we have to talk with carl and others to see you know what direction we should go we, we we're gonna i'm gonna have well, i was gonna i was gonna give you an come idea out and give us you know an idea what because it's they're they're in pretty good shape it's just the pilings are all broken and the dead men and the joists and i mean it's a pretty easy fix but yeah, but there's also another big billboard that's kind of like. Oh, yeah, we. Yeah, anyway. It, and you'd have to work with community development and mm -hmm. probably come back to council to get a waiver here and there. But it, you might be able to get money to restore that billboard from different merchants if we could figure out a way to where they could get a little advertising along the border or something on it. But that's. Mm -hmm. uh, but I they're not, not as bad as they look. <laughs> the, the paintings the are actually in great shape. It's just the infrastructure holding the paintings up. All right. Well, one of them's all bent. Oh yeah, we could. Uh, if there's a will, there's a way. So we got to see. You know, make well, maybe sure. Maybe Carl has a suggestion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. The, Carl Swing. So the the sign the, the um, what are we calling them? Yeah. Historic hand-painted murals. Yes, the historic hand-painted <laughs> murals. We've been talking about for a number of years now, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and I think from a staff viewpoint, our recommendation would be to council with the details yet to be flushed out, uh, would be to try to restore those signs. Um, there's, I've always felt personally that there's a difference between the historic use and structures that are there versus the balance of the downtown. And there's, I'm sure there's a way to get from here to there and we're willing to work on that and of course bring anything back to council for what they might consider. Okay, anybody last call? All right, Mike. Uh, well, actually this involves more of the board. I just figured there's enough of us here. I, I just wanted to bring up, I know Twisted Tangle would like to paint and it's kind of a city issue but it's also a board issue because it's currently owned by the board. Um, so I was just wondering if we could give permission for the Twisted Tangle to apply to uh, repaint the building to the city. I, I think they already went. I believe that um, Alicia had already met with the, the architect, Sam, for the color palette that they had offered her at one time. And so... Well, I, I think it's because it's still owned by Wonder Gardens. They, she needs permission mm -hmm. from us that she can do it. So. I believe we gave her permission. I think the other bump was just the, it had to go in front of the historical society was the last yeah. bit well, of business. Yeah. Well, we, we gave her the green light, yeah. but it has to go through that process of the historical mm -hmm. society at their meeting and then city council and then she's good to go. Just for the record, that'd be the historic preservation board. Oh, okay. So yes, you're asking us all right, anybody else? Marjorie? I'd, I'd just like to make um, one observation that as horrible as Irma was, something good did come out of it because people who didn't know that the Wonder Gardens existed now know it. They, there has been so much publicity, um, so many volunteers who had never heard of it before that um, so it was a, it's going to make it easier to fundraise because our problem, <coughs> one of our problems in fundraising before was trying to raise money from people who did not know we existed. And edu we didn't have enough time to educate mm -hmm. the community about who we were. Well, we have made massive strides in educating the community right. thanks to Irma. Mm -hmm. So something good came out of it. 
and I'll, I'll echo Marjorie's comments. This is Russ. Linda and I staff the membership desk at the Family Fund Day. <clears throat> we, got, we gave out every single membership application we could find. <laughs> uh, we had everybody wow. said that um, they've never been there. They've lived they in Bonita for 17 years, years, nine years, wow. and they've never been to the gardens. And they loved we, it. We had 11 and 15 year olds looking for uh, volunteer opportunities. I mean, it's just <coughs> coming out of the woods. Yeah. It was very heartwarming to see the, the response from the community when they were coming and going. I mean, we said thousands. I think we had a counter. Excuse me, my name's Linda. But I, I wish we had had a counter to see exactly how many people came through or, you know, pretty close to it because it, it was just, it was a, amazing. It was just a wonderful, wonderful day, and, and um, people were just so pleased to see what, what it is, because they didn't know what it was before. So. I know what, Gary Price and his <coughs> helpers made 750 hot dogs and hamburgers, and they were all gone yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had quickly. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell Kathy. <laughs> I actually went and bought more hamburgers. <laughs> <laughs> you ran out. I, yeah. I might also, um, as a new board member, invite you, if you have time at the end of the meeting, to take a quick look at the class kits. I was uh, helping Beth show some kits, and she was asking a lady if she was a teacher, and the lady said no, and she had two children with her, and the children said, well, but we're students, could we look at them? <laughs> and so I pulled out one of the books, and the little boy was just enthralled. It was one of the ones about the birds. He recognized three of the birds from the birds he had seen because they were, had toured the Wonder Gardens and they were on their way home. And he said, those are so cool. Mm -hmm. Can I, I'm gonna go home and tell my teacher about this when I go to school on Monday. Can she check out one of these kits? And I said, of course she can. How long can she have them? I said, for a month. Good, I'm gonna tell her to call and get one of these kits for my class. And I said, good for you, sweetie. So uh, they were a big hit and we had several people become sponsors and several teachers checked them out that day. So we do invite you to take a look at them. They're, they're pretty cool, so please do. As a former educator. Yeah. That was, this has been fun to work on, so thank you. Great. Well, thank you all, uh, Trish. Thank you, thank Thomas, you. the entire you. board. Thank you for all your hard work. We Thanks really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Happy, Happy, adjourned. Happy Thanksgiving, yes. everyone. Yes. Save the turkey.